I hope you will all continue enjoying your dinner and the lovely dessert. And we are so grateful for the generous support from all of our quantum experience sponsors, donors, and partners. We also want to recognize and thank those who sponsored this event that unfortunately was not able to take place in 2020 due to COVID. And many of you are here again with us tonight, and we really, really appreciate your generous support for 2020 and again this year. I would like to introduce Scott Meacham. Scott Meacham leads I2E's efforts to create knowledge-based jobs in Oklahoma through the development and investment in high growth companies. Please welcome Scott Meacham. Thank you, Katie. By the way, don't tell anybody, but you were the smartest person I worked with in my eight years at the state capitol. And, and, and when, when she left, the IQ of the building went down dramatically. I'll just say that. No offense to anyone in the legislature that's here today. <laughs> so welcome back. It's been, what, a little two-year hiatus that we've taken? And I've missed you all. Hopefully you've missed me. I, you know, I thought, well, I'm in a time capsule. And I need to set my time capsule two years back so I don't miss a beat from last time we met. I made a little mistake. I, I walked in and I saw Dan Little and Edna Manning running this place again. I thought, oh my gosh, they said I did 20 years. <laughs> but it, it is good to be with you tonight. And I, I, I'm an outspoken supporter of Awesome and the, and the great mission that it has and, and the fabulous uh, young people that it serves, and, and you're going to hear a lot of stories tonight about about those people and the lives and the difference that this school made in their, their lives. And so it's an easy thing for me to do. The other thing is I'm also the audience advocate. My job is to get you out of here in a reasonable amount of time, and we have a really tight set schedule. The only thing that made me a little nervous is there's two five-minute speeches on here, one for Dan Little and one for Edna Manning. And so... <laughs> So, pl well, please help me, because Pam said she explained to you, you only had five minutes. So if they go, I mean, give them a few, you know, give them five minutes and 30 seconds, but just start politely and gently tapping your watch if they go over their time for me. Anyway, it's great to be here. Let me just tell you a little bit about this institution and, and the difference it makes. So it's ranked among, in the top 1% of public institutions in the whole nation. Obviously, it'd be number one in Oklahoma, right, if you're in the top 1% in the whole nation. It's one of only 16 similar schools in the country and is unique in Oklahoma and really a trendsetter across the country. Its, its model is extremely effective and transformational for students and it's strengthening Oklahoma's much needed STEM pipeline with every graduating class, which only helps build out our economy of the future in Oklahoma. More than 1,900 bright Oklahoma students have graduated from Awesome's residential programs since 1990. More than a third are engineers, another approximately a third are in medicine and bioscience with the rest in computer and data sciences, finance, which is really important, um, and, other field, and other similar fields. Some 85% of the graduates of this, of this institution pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That is, that is very impressive. You know, I, I, I always, people I used to always ask me, well, why should we support Awesome? Why, why should we do that? When, when I was, you know, in a position that mattered, <laughs> people would, would ask me that. And I, I would say, why not? Don't we owe it as a state to our very brightest and best students to give them the best possible educational opportunity. And that's what Awesome does. It brings our best and brightest in, it surrounds them by fa surrounding fabulous faculty and gives them the chance to learn and excel. Not only that, you know, I'm from, I'm from Western Oklahoma. Uh, I'm a, a fifth generation Western Oklahoman. And in Western Oklahoma and across rural Oklahoma, it is hard to get the quality of faculty that we need in our schools. And it's hard to have AP classes and things like physics and, and, and math courses. I mean, we just can't afford it anymore. And, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes coaches end up, nothing against coaches, 
Uh, but but it's, not the, it's not the best situation. And I think the awesome model is great because not only does it have regional centers where it's going out in the state and offering kind of a magnet for people to come in, but it offers virtual AP programs. And I always thought, well, that is the solution for Western Oklahoma. I'm not sure why Katie didn't fix that when she was in, in, in the governor's <laughs> office, but it needs to be fixed. Maybe we can send you back on a special mission to get that done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned just today that, that this year, Awesome is always also providing physics education in the Tulsa Public School System. So it's not just a rural solution, it's a statewide solution. So there's a lot of great stories you're gonna hear about tonight about this great institution and the difference it's made. The first of our alumni honorees for tonight, and by the way, I am from Western Oklahoma, so when I mispronounce your name, just understand we have a genetic problem in Western Oklahoma about <laughs> pronouncing people's names, okay? Our first alumni honoree tonight is Dr. Katie Marr. Katie knew she wanted to be a doctor, but her story is one of so many where students found additional possibilities of awesome that they never had anticipated. My homeschool, Enid High, had given me a solid foundation in math and science, but there were limited options for advanced classwork. By 10th grade, I had taken the highest level classes available to me, but I was still looking for a bigger challenge. During my first few months at OSSM, I had incredible opportunities to take advanced science and math classes from college level professors with PhDs in their fields. One of the most unique opportunities I had at OSSM was the mentorship program, which is an immersive experience working in a basic science lab at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Prior to going to OSSM, I had never met someone with a PhD before. I thought of scientists as people you see in movies, but it hadn't occurred to me that people could be scientists in real life and that I could be one too. Working in that lab during my senior year of high school was so much fun. Learning how to formulate hypotheses, test them in real time, and discover new ideas was thrilling and opened my eyes to the possibility of becoming a scientist in addition to being a doctor. That's when I learned from my career advisor at OSSM about MD-PhD programs, where you could combine training as a medical doctor with PhD training in a basic scientific field. From then on, that became my goal, and I have OSSM to thank for providing me the education and exposure to achieve it. I went on to do my internal medicine residency training at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and I'm now doing further specialty training as a physician and a scientist in the field of oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, where I hope to study cancers of the blood and work toward improving care for patients with these diseases. I would never have been able to achieve these things without the strong educational foundation I got at OSSM. For many of my peers and colleagues, I am the first Oklahoman they've met. When they ask me about my background, they're impressed to learn about the opportunities that were available to me as a high schooler at OSSM, particularly as a tuition-free school open to the public to Oklahoma students from every socioeconomic background. I look at what my classmates and I are doing today both in Oklahoma, as well as other top-notch institutions in the country. And I'm forever grateful and proud of the representation we have on the national stage that would never be possible without the experiences we had at OSSM. Katie could not be with us tonight, but one of her fellow alums who also followed the MD, PhD path in medicine is with us tonight, Dr. Leticia Camp Heinlein. Leticia, where are you? Oh, there she is. We're so proud of both of you, Leticia. Uh, Dr. Heinlein is a specialist in rheumatology, a much needed specialty in our state, and has her practice here in Oklahoma City. And on a special note, Leticia is sitting with her daughter, Elizabeth, who is attending Awesome right now. Wow. Robin Grainsteiner Miller came to Awesome from Mustang High School and graduated with the class of 1996. She is one of many grads, more than a third, who became an engineer, and she is also one of many who own their own businesses here in Oklahoma. I 
I definitely know that OSSM is an asset to the state of Oklahoma. Right now, my daughter goes to a very small school. She's only got so many classes that she can take. Physics and calculus are only offered every other year because they don't have enough students that would take it. If someone is wanting to go into a very math or science heavy career, they need something like OSSM. One of my best friends is from Bremen, Oklahoma, which I don't know how many they graduated, but it was probably, you could probably count it on both hands. Now she's a chemical engineer and she's doing very well. Right now, as a, as a business owner, we're a very small business, uh, Sage Mill Construction. We have six employees full time and we do about two and a half to three million a year, but this year is kind of a banner year for us and we might actually gross uh, six to seven million dollars in projects. So we're growing. So that's something that our business is doing to help the economy in Oklahoma. In order to run my own company, I think OSSM gave me time management skills, uh, the ability to work hard. OSSM was instrumental in helping me pay for college. I was not from a rich family. OSSM helped me prepare for the ACT to get it to the point where I uh, uh, got the Regent Scholarship and several other scholarships. It also helped me with my essay writing ability, so I was able to, to get other scholarships. These are you know things that you don't think about, um, but your communication, your writing is so important, even as an engineer. It's not just about math and science. So they really prepared me in that aspect. The OSSM is a huge influential part of Oklahoma going forward. I really believe that And Robin is with us tonight, I believe. Robin, will you stand up or raise your hand so you can see? There she is. <laughs> Robin, we're so proud of you. You spent years working in the aerospace industry, one of Oklahoma's largest and most important, and now you strengthen your local economy with a thriving business of your own. Thank you for making us proud. Lieutenant Colonel August A.G. Rosner is one of many awesome alums who have served and are serving our country in U.S. Armed Forces. I was in a very small town at a very small school. There were five kids, five students in my class. So the opportunities for additional classes were limited. Um, the, the school was great, the teachers were great, but there just wasn't a high demand for anything beyond calculus. I would have been the only student probably in a calculus class, just Calc 1, much less Calc 2 or, or differential equations or something beyond that. Probably the, the biggest thing I learned from OSSM was that I like to be challenged. I don't like things to be, you know, just handed to me to be easy. and. A lot of the classes that I took before going to OSSM came just easy to me, and that was definitely not the case at OSSM. Um, I, was, I was challenged very, very much. I continue to do that throughout the, the vast majority of my life thus far. After serving in the U.S. Air Force for 20 years and four days, um, I, I retired from the Air Force and joined a corporation called the MITRE Corporation. We operate six different federally funded and research development center, so FFRDCs. We're a not-for-profit organization. We are simply trying to help the government solve their difficult problems, to solve problems for a safer world. From cryptocurrency to climate change to autonomous vehicles, because of my background in the Air Force and security clearances that I already had, my roles have largely been supporting the Department of Defense and our national security. Attending OSSM was the impetus for me being where I am now. Although AG and other alums are right, residing outside of Oklahoma, their impact in so many ways is felt here at home and across the U.S. and the world. AG is helping the U.S. government solve problems that impact us all. Another of our 2001 alums, Will Atkins, is serving is helping protect our country from cybersecurity threats with Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. Another alum, Dr. Geoffrey Beach, heads the Beach Labs at MIT working on the next way of computing that will help solve the data storage problems across the world. Dr. Riju Das, head of Das Labs at Stanford, was the focus of a PBS Nova special decoding COVID-19 in May of 2020. Another alum in Colorado, Dr. Greg Beckham, 
is working on an enzyme that we eat plastic, trying to solve the world's problem of plastic in the environment. Dr. Beckham spoke here via Zoom earlier this year and reported they have the enzyme and are now working on how to put it to use in the economy. Two more alums, Whitley O'Connor, class of 2010 and co-founder of the Curbside Chronicle and other nonprofit businesses here in Oklahoma City, and 2011 grad Dr. Caleb LaRue, postdoctoral fellow at Stanford researching the molecular basis of cancer and scientific co-founder of Cartography Biosciences, a startup developing precision immunotherapies, were both recognized among Forbes 30 under 30 this year. That's an impressive achievement for these awesome graduates. Some 60% of awesome alums, we believe, are living and working right here in Oklahoma in STEM businesses across our state. More than half attend college in Oklahoma, with OU being awesome's by far our largest recipients of, of students. Dr. Charles T. is a cardiac electrophysiologist at the Oklahoma Heart Hospital here in Oklahoma City, one of three awesome alums who are physicians and surgeons here. Throughout all of my classes in my hometown, that's, the teachers were great, it's just that the topics were pretty straightforward and I didn't feel like I was ever really challenged. The kids that benefit the most from OSSM are kids that are in smaller towns where their schools don't necessarily have all the offerings that OSSM has. And it's gonna be pretty rare to find a high school in the state of Oklahoma that has all the offerings that the Oklahoma School of Science and Math has. Yeah, I went from being kind of a star student in my home school to kind of an average student at OSSM. So that was very humbling. And then also just, you know, encountering subjects and topics that are very difficult for me. And, you know, I had to actually ask for help, not just from teachers but from professors, but also just my classmates. Recognizing that when I need help, to kind of put my ego aside and, you know, ask for help when you need it. And so just getting that mindset of school can be harder, classes can be harder, you're gonna to have to have a good work ethic and kind of focus to actually kind of get through the curriculum. So that kind of mindset with OSSM, with basically college level classes, the weekend tests, was a great preparation for college. And then I stayed at OU for uh, training in internal medicine. And then I stayed again for my fellowship in cardiology. And I did one extra year of sub sub specialty training in cardiac electrophysiology. And then I got a job here at the hospital. And I started here in August of 2014. I think that the Oklahoma School of Science and Math uh, is incredibly important for the state. You know, there's many children throughout the state that are excelling beyond what their local schools can provide them. And I think that by encouraging their development locally, you know, it kind of starts to bring them back when they're done training. I think for me and a lot of my uh, classmates, you know, we're still here in Oklahoma. Like, you know, we all are professionals, whether we're doctors or engineers, lawyers, you know, we most of us have come back to Oklahoma, building these bonds with other kids around the state, having these opportunities earlier in life, seeing that being in Oklahoma, the people we know with great education kind of brings us back. Charles came to Austin from Guyman, and if you've ever been to Guyman, and I have, I promise you, it was a long ride back and forth on, on weekends when he went home. His classmate, Chris Schrock, also from Guyman, shared many of these rides back and forth with him. And he tells a story of when his father suffered a heart attack and he found himself at the Oklahoma Heart Hospital. Chris describes the relief he had and the gratitude in his heart when he learned that his fa father's surgeon was no other than his friend and classmate, Dr. Charles T. He knew his father was gonna be in great hands at that point. There are so many incredible stories. These are just a few. Tonight, you're gonna to have the privilege of hearing more in depth from a, another one of our great, awesome success stories, our keynote speaker, Todd Edmonds. I had the fortune to sit by Todd at night at this evening as for our dinner, and for, well, the first thing I was impressed with was I could actually understand him. I usually get to sit by the speakers, and they're talking, they're talking about physics and stuff. This is a finance guy, so I could relate to him. <laughs> but. Todd, Todd came to Austin from Inola, Oklahoma, which is maybe a little bigger than the one that class that had five. I think yeah, you had a few more. Slightly. Yeah, from Inola, Oklahoma, and graduated in the class of 2012. 
He graduated from Oklahoma State University in 2016, receiving degrees in mathematics and physics before attending Cornell University where he received a master's in financial engineering. Currently taught as a vice president in equity derivative trading at Goldman Sachs in New York City and a guest lecturer at Cornell teaching classics classes on complex derivatives and financial structures. Todd, welcome back home. Well, hello everyone. It's good to be back in Oklahoma. <laughs> Now, I know OSSM is changing. Um, it's learning, and I think this is evidence. After however many years of holding this fundraiser, they finally had the money alum come, <laughs> all right? So here we are. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was getting approvals to, to come talk here this evening, and at Goldman, they're, they're, they're a little bit uh, weary about whenever you go to state agencies and start talking about your experiences at Goldman. Um, so I, I, I've been cleared to, to answer questions, but my, uh, my, my thoughts are my own and are no reflection of Goldman Sachs. <laughs> now, Dr. Manning gave me some background of previous speakers, their groundbreaking and unimaginable exploits in the scientific field. She told me having a, a speaker from the business world may be a fresh and new look uh, to, to what we're, we're normally uh, used to. However, to this contention, I must disagree because science is not necessarily what you study, but how you study it. And I just so happen to be a scientist of money. <laughs> and you know, I've been to a lot of these speeches uh, filled with cliches, phenomenal stories of success, and you get if you get a, re a really, really good one, you might get a watered-down version of some struggles that an individual has gone through. Tonight, I hope to maybe turn that around and talk a bit about my struggles from being from Oklahoma to making it to, to Goldman and what has come in between. So the first of these journeys, I'm going to uh, talk into it as a scientist because we've determined I am one and we're gonna talk about them in the form of experiments. The first of my hypothesis was getting a college degree will make my life better. Now, it's a hard one to observe, but I would agree that the, uh, I would argue that the results have proven true. Looking back now, it was pretty obvious that my methods could have used some improvements. I was 16 years old, and it spent all 16 of those years in Inola, Oklahoma, a town of 1,500, on a farm when I decided to do this experiment and against my parents' wishes, I came to OSSM and embarked on the first hardest thing of my life. I worked the hardest I had ever worked. I got the worst grades I had ever received. I almost quit. I forgot to call my parents. I missed some college application deadlines. I mishandled friendships which up to no one's fault but my own, led to loss of relationships of those I was most close to. You see, this school is great. The academics speak for themselves. The professors are bar none the most passionate and giving educators I've ever had the privilege of interacting with. But all those greatnesses combined can't hold a candle to the thing I love most about this school. And that is the basement of this great hall. <laughs> Perhaps to most, it was just a room for the students to relax. But for us, it was a coliseum, a stage. It was a party, and it was anything else we could make of it. But more than anything, we all thought we knew something. And in the basement was a place that, away from the prying ears of adults that could tell us we were wrong, we could, we could debate and we could challenge each other's beliefs. We could create our own social constructs. It was a place with no rules. It was up to the devices of wild and immense youthful intelligence. And given those parameters, since the day I've left, I've tried to find that again. Now, I did leave here, and I went to Oklahoma State University, where I started my first experiment to try to find this basement. 
So my second hypothesis, it would be possible to create the OSSM culture at Oklahoma State University. My first method was to join a fraternity. <laughs> I figured people forced to live together would naturally create a stimulating community of thought-provoking questions and novel ideas. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Uh, it, tur it turns out having separate dormitories for the boys and girls might have something to do with it, but that's just a hunch. So after chalking that one up as a failure, I would go to the physics department and convince them to give us an old room to create a lounge. This was pretty good, but it lacked something that I would later determine to be captive discussion, a discussion which forced people to be around each other. It had, you had no choice but to try and understand the perspectives of those that you were talking to. Now looking at our society, our society and our current model in this media-driven world, I would love to have this captivity. And I wish to share the, and argue with those that have different beliefs in me. I would love to be able to understand you and, and find common ground, or at least understand how you think. But just as before, my methods definitely needed some improvement. The biggest idea of which was the idea of being special. You see, most kids that come through the school are special, and they're told so from a very young age. And I think the results support the fact that they, they are special. I think all of the numbers we've heard here tonight would at least back up with data what we've heard. Now, being special doesn't really get you anything. You have to do something. Having a propensity to learn and a skill set that is valuable does not inherently make you valuable to society. Now, when I was looking at my college career, this is what I found that I had failed at. I was special but did not contribute. I did research on particle physics in Switzerland on CERN but I quit before I needed to publish papers. I held positions of importance and power on campus, but I failed to obtain the recognition that the university deserved that my predecessors and my successors were able to obtain. In the end, I had two degrees, many connections, few friends, and no job. This experiment failed because I could not give up this idea of being special. I tried to force those around me into debate and arguments when it turns out most of the world does not desire that stimulation. <laughs> As the experiment concluded, I was lucky enough to have a direction to go on, a goal to achieve, and with it came a competitive field to play in, Wall Street. For those who know me know that I have one trait above all else. I love competition. In fact, when I decided to come to OSSM, that was the biggest decision I had to make. I was on track to become quite a basketball player, and coming here, I gave up that passion. So whenever it, it, I found out that going into the stock market had a great amount of competition inherently involved with the process, along with the mathematics that I loved so much, it was an obvious career choice. The next step, getting in. And since I had chosen a career based solely on YouTube videos, movies, and a few mathematical finance courses, I really had no idea what I was getting into. Naturally, with the unwarranted self-confidence, I figured I would just go and get a job at whatever the best firm there was. But it turns out, if you're from a small town in Oklahoma who wasn't very good at keeping friends, and it's really hard to get any job, it's really, really hard to get any job on Wall Street, let alone at the best firm. So with this new direction, it was time to start a new experiment. But I didn't know how to formulate the hypothesis. And it felt different this time. Somehow it didn't feel like whatever the result, I would be OK. It was going on a new part of my life. It was starting a new journey. And so I was nervous, confused. I had no one to give me guidance. I was a first generation college graduate. And so where did I go? I came back here. I came back to OSSM. I found time on Dr. Wong's calendar. And I said, this is my predicament. And he said, I have just the guy for you. It was a 
I think it was a class of 2000 alum, perhaps, that lived in Austin. I got his contact information, and he, he agreed to have a coffee with me. I drove eight hours for a 30-minute conversation. I explained my situation and my predicament of not wanting to go in debt for an education so tailored to an industry I didn't really understand. I'm sure he gave me some great advice, but only one thing stuck out to me. He told me if I wanted to make it big, I would have to bet on myself sooner or later. And this is where my mindset changed, where I went from being a scientist to being in industry. But it sounds easy, right, to make a bet? Millions of people make bets every weekend on football games. People make livings out of placing bets on poker games. But the thing about betting on yourself is you need to accomplish something. A bet on a football game means teams must accomplish a game. There must be a winner and a loser, and we can settle the bet on the outcome. In Texas Hold'em, the river needs to be turned so we can, result, so we can see the result and compare hands. And for me, the tendency of almost finishing and counting on being special ended once I decided to make this bet. I either get a job or I fail and lose. I don't like losing. So the bet was made and I moved to New York. I started school at Cornell and within five weeks I was accepted to the Goldman Sachs internship. Now this was the sales and trading internship. It's one of the uh, oldest and largest, most historically influential internships in all of finance. Now there have been numerous books and movies written about Goldman trading, financial markets, and for those lucky enough to get into this industry, industry, it's mainly through these internships. And I use the word lucky purposefully to demonstrate why. Let's go through some numbers. Last year there were 236,000 applicants to the internship at Goldman Sachs. 3.7 thousand or 1.56 percent were accepted. Of those accepted, roughly 500 will be in revenue generating seats. These are the seats that end up being subjects of literature and drama, as we discussed. Of those, roughly 70 to 80 percent will get a full-time offer, and so at this point we're at 0.17 percent of applicants get into the job that we all think of of Wall Street. Then, to stay in the industry, to gain responsibility and see the fruition of the labor, I only have anecdotal numbers left of those in my analyst class. So of those 400 to 500, about 25 are left. This makes it 0.01% of applicants make it to this spot, or one in 10,000. Now I know a lot of processes, but I have rarely encountered any that are this accurate. And through the years, I have known so many that have desired to join this industry and have just had a bad interview or weren't able to find the connections to get through the resume screenings. So long story short, I made it through the internship and I got a job trading equity exotics. And I was lucky to do so. By this point, I had started to lose some of my scientific process and moved into this mindset of industry, a mindset where it mattered it mattered whether or not you were right or wrong. It wasn't a finding either way. Where there was a goal, and it was not to try to get the answers, but to get the results. Now here I am. I've been in the industry for five years. I get peppered with questions about the industry all the time. Even though it is, only, it is true that only about 2% of applicants get into the firm, it was much harder to stay. When I started, I was a sprightly 24-year-old fresh out of grad school. I worked roughly 17 hours a day. It was a 6 a.m. in and an 11 p.m. out. This was mainly due to technology, not a desire to show off or to be known for, as a hard worker. It turns out it's really hard to show off when no one's there at midnight. <laughs> the next year was reduced down to about 14 hours a day, and this is where most of my lessons were learned in the industry. At this point, I was 25. My wife, who was also from Oklahoma, and I had just gotten married, and all of our friends started to buy houses and have kids. This just did not seem feasible for me in New York. We could still barely afford our one-bedroom apartment. This was the toughest year. We almost gave up on this career. 
we almost moved back to Oklahoma to try and start a new life. But to me, it sounded like a whole lot like I was starting to lose this bet. And so I convinced her to give me one more year. And I learned the lesson without getting the bad result. See, I saw that my inability to think about anything else but this competition had been draining my relationship with her. But she was the only reason I had even gotten this far. She took care of me, paid my bills, took care of the house, planned all the trips around my crazy schedule. She accepted that I was fixated on this task and she helped me try and win. And she did all this while making more money than me. <laughs> As the money alum, that was not supposed to be happening. But the next year, I was another year wiser and another year more proven and the rewards finally started to come in. And the bet paid off. But I was luckier than most because my wife was still by my side. Nowadays, work hours are different. It's somewhat self-prescribed. I have no traditional job duties. The goal is just make money. And it turns out, the harder you work, the easier it is. I think I heard that a few times whenever I was going through here. <laughs> They're never wrong. So the lesson was learned, and I started to treat this career as a marathon instead of a sprint. The goal is still ahead of me. The competition is still alive as ever. I will have many more struggles ahead. But one thing is for certain. If I win this trophy, I won't be holding it alone. It will be supported by those that helped me here, and it will be with my wife by my side. Now, being an options trader is a bit hard to explain. It's somewhat of a cross-section between rocket science, high-performance computation, salesmanship, and an outright desire to learn about the market. On a given day, you don't know if you'll be making a billion dollar deal or trying to predict the oil consumption of China for a systematic trading algorithm. The market is an intensely complicated and it's just the hardest problem I've ever tried to solve. It is something no one ever told me. This is the thing no one ever told me, is that we, and by we I mean all us adults, have no idea what we're doing. So for those that want to bet it all and take a chance, I implore you to know something. Take that knowledge and share it. Everything else will fall in place, just like those debates in the basement. I may not have found the OSSM basement that I was searching for, but the search isn't over. And something tells me, standing at this spot in this great hall, this roundabout journey has brought me the closest I've ever been. Thank you. for that very inspirational speech, of which I understood every single word, so thank you very much for that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you chose to bet on yourself, and I heard you say at one point in time you were lucky. And, you know, I heard a very wise man tell me once, you have to be lucky to be good, but you gotta be good to be lucky. And I think this institution helped you to be good, so hopefully it, hopefully it helped you a little bit on your, on your bet. So I think we have a gift for you, but I have no idea where it is. <laughs> Underneath? Sorry, I wasn't briefed well. So we have a, we have a gift for you. Okay. Well, there's, and there's a photographer who wants to take a picture. All right. Here we go. Okay. All right. All right. We also have a couple of gifts for honorees. And apparently, I didn't, I missed this, but, uh, Dr. Charles T, is, are you here? I forgot to acknowledge you. Well, stand up. I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge you before. Robin Miller, there she is.
Dan Little and I were talking a little bit ago about how many years I've been MC here, and I really can't remember. Uh, but my favorite thing that I get to do every year when I get to do this is I get to introduce Dan Little, my good, good, good friend, who fortunately is always my friend even after I introduce him. So a man who needs no introduction, I'm going to give my Scott Meacham take on. First off, Harvard undergraduate, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OU law grad, yeah, yeah, yeah. Former Democrat, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the oldest man in the world, wait, that wasn't it. The oldest man to finish the world marathon, that's it. <laughs> and, he, and that was when you were what, like 73 years young or something like that? 76. 76 years young? Well, you know, a man has to be insane at age 76 to go do that. How many years ago was that? Four. 76, 77. I'm, I'm from Western Oklahoma. We got to count our figures. 77, 78, 79, 80. 80 years old, and he's going to go do it again. <laughs> so, Todd, I don't know about you, but I'm betting on Dan to finish this this marathon, and I think that's a much better bet than betting on OU or OSU in football this year. <laughs> but seriously, Dan Little is one of the greatest guys I know. He's, he's brilliant, everybody knows that, but he's just, he's just a wonderful person with a wonderful heart that cares deeply, and, and the first time I really dealt with, with Dan Little was really about this institution and needing money to help build this institution. He was a visionary co-founder of this, of this institution, and he has passionately, passionately supported it, built it, and nurtured it from day one. So please welcome my friend, Dan Little. Dr. Manning, Dr. Wong, distinguished faculty, ladies, gentlemen, and friends, how can it possibly be that we are celebrating our 30th anniversary? And there, there are so many people in this room who have been a wonderful, critical part of this effort. And oh my gosh, Todd, all of these students that we just watched what they're doing, we knew, we knew you were gonna do well, but oh my gosh, did we know you were gonna do this well? Not really, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I told Scott, I don't know how to respond to your nice introduction. Um, but earlier, we were talking about how many years has Scott Meacham been our master of ceremonies? And his answer was, well, I think four or five. And I said, Scott, I don't remember that we ever had a master of ceremonies other than you. So, but even more importantly, from the very beginning, Scott Meacham has been our public advocate and strong, strong supporter. So, Scott, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I'm supposed to give you a presidential search update. Because of confidentiality, I can tell you that we are working hard. We hope to have a person named this fall and a person on board by the end of the year. But uh, because of confidentiality, I cannot tell you more. For 22 years, 
It was my honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Edna Manning. And tonight, it is my honor and privilege and with greatest appreciation to introduce her again as our interim president. But before doing so, there are two people I want to give special recognition and appreciation to. For 10 years of dedicated, wonderful, hard work, I want to express appreciation, and all of us express appreciation, to Dr. Frank Wong. Now, the second person, and he was going to be here, but he's not here, but this is being videoed, so I want to recognize him before, anyway. And he is a person who has not only supported Awesome from the very beginning, and perhaps before the very beginning, and who has worked his magic completely in the background so many times and so many ways for the benefit of awesome, as he has done on so many other worthy causes for the benefit of Oklahoma. Ladies and gentlemen, our awesome hero our Oklahoma hero, and the personal hero of so many of us, let us honor Gene Rainbolt. In fact, it was with the strong support of Gene Rainbolt that Dr. Edna Manning became our first president. And for 22 years, Dr. Manning became the architect, the builder, and the heart and soul of the Oklahoma School of Science and Mathematics. We could not have been more fortunate than to have Dr. Manning be willing to serve as our interim president and to meet the tremendous challenges coming out of COVID. In so many ways, Dr. Manning and her year as interim president will pave the way for our new president and our new era. Ladies and gentlemen, the builder, the heart and soul of the Oklahoma School of Science and Mathematics, Dr. Edna Manning. Leadership like we get from Dan Little, it would be hard to fail. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate what you do. I want to express gratitude not only to Dan, but to all of the members of the Board of Trustees that I've been privileged to work with through the years. It would not be possible without you. I'd like to thank those of you on the Foundation Board. You've made many of our dreams come true by providing the resources that it takes. And I'd like to thank all of you who've been our supporters and our donors through the years. Would not be possible without you. I would like for all of the former students who are here tonight to stand. Thank you very much. I 
see educators, I see doctors, I see engineers. Let's see, I see a pilot. What have I left out? Just about everything. Yes, a finance man. How could I forget a finance man? Let me, let me tell you something about Todd that he didn't tell you. He made the basketball team as a walk-on at OSU. So he's a man of many talents. Now, when Todd started talking to us about coming, he said, you know, Dr. Manning, did you know we did? I said, of course I knew it. And then he went on, did you know we did this? Well, of course I knew it. And I thought, I don't need this confession, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with a lot of teenagers through my life, and it's a wonderful opportunity. I wondered when I looked at the program the first time I saw it, it said building the future. Dan, they're getting a couple of octogenarians to build the future. <laughs> The young people that I just pointed out are the future, and when I stop and think about it, we have helped build the future because we've been able to work with these young people. We've had help along the way. I would like for all of the former faculty members and staff members who are here tonight to stand. Dorothy Dodd was one of the very first faculty members that I employed when we were trying to get the, grant, the school off the ground, going to the legislature, persuading them that this was a worthwhile endeavor that would help make a difference in the future of the state of Oklahoma. Dr. Dodd was director of gifted and talented for the state of Oklahoma, working for the State Department. I called my friend Sandy Garrett and said, I need help working with the legislature and I need somebody who knows all the data on gifted young people in Oklahoma. She assigned Dorothy to work with me. Fortunately, she came and helped and we were able to get all of the legislation through that we needed to get started, just get started. We knew if we could do that, we could be successful. Suzanne Donalow was one of the first directors of admissions. In fact, she was the director of admission that helped set us on the path we've been on to identify these young people all across the state. So they are part of helping to build the future. I'd like to thank Dr. Frank Wong for his service to the school and Dr. Brent Richards, who's one of our alums, who is now the Vice President for Academic Services here at OSSM. And I'd like to thank Dr. Ken Lease. Dr. Lease, stand. Dr. Lease. I certainly could not have done it without Dr. Ken Lease. He is actually the brains behind the school. He is the one that set the academic program in motion, fostered it, developed it, and he's back to help us renew that at this point. That freed me up, his ability to work in that area freed me up to do many of the other things that had to be done for the school to be successful. So thank you, Dr. Lees. When I see young people like this, like we've had here at OSSM and like Todd that you've heard tonight, we're in good hands. The future of the school is in good hands. The future of the state is in good hands. And hopefully the future of the country will be in good hands. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Shortest speech I ever heard you give. <laughs> and the best, clearly. And, and by the way, thank you so much for stepping back in at, as interim president of this institution that you, you built to this point. Well, 
schedule. Pam, we're almost on schedule. <laughs> I mean, we're almost there. So for, uh, it's my pleasure tonight to be here with you and spend this evening with you. I, I want to thank our speakers. Todd, I want to thank you for coming home and, and sharing with us. Uh, it was a great speech. The, I want to thank all the sponsors. Um, obviously, this place and this event wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you so much for sharing your nights with us tonight. I know if you're like me, it's not easy to get out during the weeknight and come to an event, so thank you for taking time away from your favorite TV show, whatever it might be, to come here tonight. And, and, and thank you for supporting this great institution. You know, I, I, I'm a Baptist, so I have a tendency to be a little evangelical and preach to the choir, so I'm gonna to preach to the choir an evangelical message as we close. I believe this institution is a treasure for this state and for the best and brightest we have in this state, across the state. But I think not enough people know about it. And, and you, I'm deputizing all of you all to go out and evangelize and let people know about the great impact that this institution can have, will have, and she'll continue to have as long as it gets the support to grow and thrive and reach even more people. So thank you all for being here tonight and be safe going home. Thank you.